turn it on, I guess. It's a good place to be sheltered in the arms of God. And uh, in fact, there's no better place to be sheltered than in the arms of God. Need to be reminded of that and reminded of the fact that the Lord is coming back. It's interesting to me that somehow the Thessalonians had uh, misunderstood the message of Scripture. And I think that from time to time, we do that as well. And I want to talk about that a little bit. What to do when we get a little misunderstood or, or misunderstanding in our mind about things in the kingdom of God and things in life that we address each and every day. But let's bow our heads, ask God's blessing before we do that. Heavenly Father, I thank you today <coughs> for the word that reminds us of all the beautiful things that await us and for the wonderful things that we have in our life today. So God, make it clear in our hearts. And I pray, God, today that as I bring forth your message, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit so that the words I speak in the meditation of my heart would be that from you to your people, that your word would be spoken and not my own, and that all the praise and the glory would be given to Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. I like this particular verse of Scripture, or verses of Scripture, and I like the idea behind why Paul is writing this to the Thessalonians. Uh, they were relatively new in the faith, and as oftentimes happens, even today, we miscue the Word of God, we misunderstand it, we misinterpret it, we have confusion in our mind about what God is trying to tell us. So Paul launches into this beautiful, beautiful scenario of the coming of the Lord that will happen one day and the, when the trumpet of the Lord will sound and the sky will be filled with the glory of God and, and Christ will descend upon the earth to take us to be with him and there'll be a glorious, wonderful time in the church on the day that that happens, amen? I mean, aren't we all looking forward to that? I hope so, okay? The coming of the Lord. It's going to be a great thing. It'll be exciting. And we'll finally know Christ face to face for the first time. So it's a great day to be looking forward to it. And, and it's a beautiful thought. And it's something that, that the Thessalonians were struggling with. Because in those days and at this particular time, the church thought the coming of Jesus was immediate. So when their loved ones began to die off and were being buried, they began to worry that the fact that they were already gone, that they would miss the coming of the Lord because they were already dead or asleep, as it's phrased in, in the Scripture. So there was this new thought of, of Scripture, this new understanding that was putting panic in the heart of the believers that, those that had already gone just missed the whole thing. And that this beautiful day, the coming of the Lord, when the clouds are going to part and all this stuff's going to happen, that their loved ones, they were afraid, were going to be left out. And so Paul comes to address this issue because they had misunderstood the intention of the word. They had misunderstood the second coming. And they had their own mind, their own version of how it was planning out, and they didn't like it. So it was words of comfort that Paul decides to bring to them, to give them an understanding of the truth of how it would all play out, and to remind them that their loved ones who had already passed, who had already gone, were in no way, shape, fashion, or form going to miss the joy of that day. And so we read from the Scripture. We read from His Word. He said, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of the Lord and the dead in Christ shall rise. We're talking about the bodily resurrection there. Then we who are alive, 
will, and remain will be caught up together. And, and then he's saying we'll all join together at that time. Nobody's going to miss anything. And then he says, use these words to comfort one another. In other words, help your neighbor understand the truth. Nobody is missing anything, but everybody is included. And those words, I have to think in my heart, brought comfort to those who were confused. Who were sort of left to kind of figure it out for themselves. So the word was brought to them. And these words of Paul comforted those who were so distressed. I mean, wouldn't you be distressed if you had that thought in your mind that Jesus is coming, but if you die first, you're out? There'd be a lot of healthy living going on, wouldn't there? Trying to... Hold on to that last moment, but that's not the intent, nor the word of God, nor what Scripture intended. So I began to wonder after reading that, and I was thinking about how they had misinterpreted that and misunderstood that kingdom fact that, that all those who come to the Lord will be involved in this. And I began to think to myself, and I began to wonder, do we ever become confused about the things of God? Kind of like the Thessalonians. Do we ever miscue the truth of what God is trying to tell us? Do we ever misunderstand the words about kingdom living? Do we ever have to comfort someone with our words who has misunderstood? Or does someone ever have to comfort us? When they hear the what we're thinking and what we believe, do they ever have to come to us and say, let me, let me talk to you about that with what the Word of God has to say? I believe sometimes we do. I believe sometimes we do perhaps misunderstand some things. And so today, I, won't, I just picked out four things that I see in the Christian world, and sometimes I even see in myself, that we don't quite get sometimes about the Word of God, or we lend ourselves to confusion. And so I just want to address these, and uh, I, I, hopefully it will mean something to you. I believe it will. But one thing I think the Christian world becomes confused about sometimes, and we do, and I want you to think about this, is the idea of forgiveness. Now, that's a beautiful thought. We're forgiven, amen? When we come to Christ, confess our, we are forgiven of our sins. Besides being a miracle of God, it's a blessed thing. But whenever I give, I don't expect it back. I don't. It's unconditional. And so what I'm saying about love is we have got to love and learn how to love in an unconditional way. And we lose this in life sometimes. We, we don't quite live that to the fullness that God intends us to live it to. We can't help ourselves sometimes. But unconditional love is something that can get skewed in, in kingdom living. As we live out our life as Christians walking in this world, God expects us to love unconditionally. That's how he has commanded us to do it. And so when I say sometimes we, we miss it or, or we lose it or we just can't grasp it completely, it's usually when we get caught up in the daily routines of life and things happen and we just react. Not as God asks us to react, but it just overpowers us, overtakes us, and we just fire back. Loving unconditionally is a costly thing. 
but it is so blessed because it pleases God. Aren't you, God, aren't you glad that God loves us unconditionally? Aren't you glad that he loves us to the extent that he doesn't place conditions? Well, I'm going to do, I'm going to give you salvation and I'm sending Jesus, but because I'm doing that, then I expect you to do these 10 things. And if you don't do these 10 things, then the deal's off. Okay? Or aren't you glad God doesn't put conditions on his love? Jesus died for the world, expecting nothing back. If only one person had accepted Christ and the rest of the world had rejected him, he still would have done that. There is no conditions on God's love other than we believe in Christ. And he still loves those who don't. He loves those who rebel against him as much as he loves those who serve and worship him. It's unconditional. So when I say we skew that, if we're honest with ourselves, we do. Because we are conditioned to be conditional. <laughs> That's how we have learned in life, and we've got to let it go. And that's hard to do. Third thing I want to mention this morning is understanding. And I'm talking about total and complete understanding. Now, bear with me on this. I've got two scriptures, so comfort yourself with these words, folks. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11 for to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Okay, the Spirit of God, where does he abide? Within our hearts. We're temples of the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. So the Spirit knows the depths of our thoughts and our feelings, our emotions, and our understanding. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So all that is saying is that God understands you. Be comforted by the idea that whatever it is you're going through in your life that's driving you up a wall today or about to put you in, over the edge, know that God understands what you are going through. Sometimes we get to the place where we think nobody understands. We think whatever is happening to us is brand new to the world, and God's up there scratching his head trying to figure out, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've never seen this before happen to one of my creations. God's not doing that. He understands everything that is troubling you today and everything you're happy about. God has complete understanding, and sometimes don't we, in the midst of our pity parties and our feeling sorry for ourselves, don't we get the idea that no one else has ever suffered as much as I'm suffering right now? That is not true, folks. That is not what the Word of God says. So sometimes we leave that and we enter into a place where nobody understands me. Woe is me. I'm, I'm the only one that's ever experienced this. Folks, understand, the Lord, understand, the Lord knows you. And having said that, let me say, sometimes we need to extend understanding to other people. Sometimes, because God expects us to encourage others in life. And to be an encourager, you have to be someone who understands. Now, we can't understand in the fullness of God, 
but we need to think, walk a mile in my shoes. I don't know why you feel like you do today, or because what you may be going through wouldn't be a problem to me. Does that make sense? But I need to understand that for you it's a problem. And whatever that is, I want you to know that I give you encouragement, that I love you, that I want you to make it through this, that you can do this, that by the power of God who understands everything that's going in your life, you can rise above this circumstance. So not only does God understand, but we've got to try to understand one another because there are people in this world that are suffering terribly because you and I won't take a moment to look at their lives and try to understand what they're going through and offer them love and sympathy and encouragement. So we got to grow up as a church and as Christians and offer this understanding and offer the word that helps others to rise above their situation. Help them see that God knows what they're going through and that he has a solution. His word is a solution. Lastly, and I'll do this pretty quick, Sometimes we forget about the limitless power of God. So be comforted by this, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will, I will rather boast about my weakness than the power of Christ, so the power of Christ may dwell in me. Okay? We are weak people. But the good news is, the weaker we are, the stronger God is. The more we confess our weaknesses to God, the more power we feel in the presence of God. Fool the most foolish words a human will ever speak is, God, I've got this, back off. I, I, I got it, Lord. Look at me, I'm strong, I can do this. Just step back. Smartest words any individual has ever spoken is, Lord, I'm broken. I can, Lord, I need you in my life to accomplish this. The weaker we become, the stronger God becomes in us. The less resistant we are to God, the more powerful he is with inside us. It's okay to be weak when you're in relationship with God because he becomes strong. And how many times in our lives, talking about skewing the word of God, have we told God to step back and then we step up to the plate and try to fix it ourselves? That usually doesn't work too well for me. Maybe you're different. I don't know. I'm trying to understand. But usually when we try to do something we ought to be letting God do, it usually goes south in a hurry, doesn't it? So understand as Christians, God's power is limitless. There is no end to the power of God in our life. And so when you begin to think about the Thessalonians... They thought they had missed the resurrection. The word of God, Paul said, is no, you haven't. Comfort one another with, these, with this understanding. And all I want to do today, because I think sometimes as a church, when we really lose it, is when we begin to live outside the truth of the word of God. And I don't think we consciously are even aware of it, that we haven't forgiven someone. It sounds simple that, you know, that so what? But it's, it's something. It's big. In God's mind, forgive. And, and, and these things that, you know, the, the idea of love. Love is so significant in God's mind and I. And unconditional love, just not any kind of love will do. And being understood is so important for us. Because it is so disheartening when you think nobody gets it, what I'm going through. They don't understand how this has damaged me or hurt me. 
but we need to try to understand the hurt of other people and the struggles that they're having in their life because God does and He expects us to. And of course, the power of God. You put all that stuff together, you forgive, you love, you understand, and you live in the power of God, and I'm telling you, your life, it'll spin around. It'll be different. It'll be different in a good way. So kingdom life can become a little confusing at times on these things. And, you know, that's just four I picked out. I mean, I probably could have got a list up of a bunch of things we kind of blend together or, or take out of context sometimes. But those four are significant. And the Lord helps us to gain clarity in life when it comes to living in his kingdom. See, we're, we're living in the kingdom now, whether you realize that or not. This world's not our home. We're, chi- we're children of the king and our citizenship's of heaven. And the part of his kingdom that is here on earth, that's us. We are his kingdom. You realize that, right? So we need to begin to live in the fullness of that kingdom as best we can. I'm not saying we can get it perfect, but I believe we can do a better job of it. Living that way. Heavenly Father, thank you. Bless us for this day that we have come to be blessed by you that we may offer the things of your kingdom to others. So God, today, just use us as you will. And Lord, I thank you for these that are here today. Lord, pray. I just pray that the word that's been spoken today would take root in our hearts. And I pray, God, today that the message has been empowered by your presence and your love and your Holy Spirit. And I thank you so much for it. So, Lord, we offer this prayer up now in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.